Good afternoon and welcome to PWSA USA's webinar on unhealthy relationships with food uh, presented by Dr. Aaron Cooper. Dr. Aaron Cooper is a clinical psychologist who specializes in the evaluation and evidence-based treatment of mood disorders, anxiety and stress, trauma, interpersonal and romantic relationships, women's health, disordered eating and body image, health-related behavioral changes, sexual health and behavior, and issues relating to LGBTQ plus identific identification. She also has experience as and interest in special needs, complex medical needs parenting. Dr. Cooper utilizes cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, and integrated behavioral couples therapy, informed treatment strategies to support patients in reaching their goals. Dr. Cooper obtained her Bachelor of Science degree from Kenyon College in Gambier, Ohio, and earned her master's degree and doctorate in clinical psychology from Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Cooper is a credentialed National Health Service psychologist and a clinical instructor for Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. In 2017, she was named Outstanding Early Career Psychologist by the Cleveland Psychological Association. Dr. Cooper runs a group practice called Westside Behavioral Health in Northeast Ohio. She lives with her husband and two children, Victoria, a delightful four-year-old with Prader-Willi syndrome and her baby brother, Grant. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Cooper. Thank you for having me. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today, we are talking about unhealthy relationships with food that we might be seeing in sibling, healthy siblings and us as caregivers. So first and foremost, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and, and a note about today's presentation, um, this is meant for general purposes and it's not intended to provide any psychological or medical advice. Um, so if you're concerned about yourself or a loved one, please seek out a licensed clinician or consult with your physician. You should also not make any changes to your diet, exercise routine, medications, et cetera, without first consulting with your medical professional. Okay, so when I was asked to give this presentation, I started looking into what research maybe has been done um, on family members of PWS loved ones and their relationship with food and how that may have changed over time. Um, but as far as I could tell, and as far as those I spoke to could tell, there really hasn't been any, any of that research. And, and my hope is that after this presentation, as a community, we can do some work to change that because I do think this is a really important aspect of of this life for all of us. Um, you know, following a PWS diagnosis, the meaning of food has likely changed in your family. Um, it might now include fear or worry and stress about doing it wrong. Um, and it, it, it's very possible that this has been a dramatic shift in the way that you purchase food, think about food, prepare your food, and even talk about food amongst yourselves as family members, and then even with friends and colleagues. Um, Importantly, older siblings um, are, you know, our older healthy siblings are going to be very aware of this shift, right? Because kids are listening, they pay attention, they notice things that we talk about, and they're going to notice that difference. And, and that's an important thing for us as parents to be mindful of. Food rules are an unfortunate necessity in most of our daily lives now. Um, my daughter, Victoria, uh, we have her treated by Dr. Miller. And anyone else who goes to see Dr. Miller knows that um, she's pretty clear on her food rules. Um, and you know, that the need of that is very um, is very well documented. And the consequences of taking kind of a lackadaisical approach to it is also potentially catastrophic. And I think most of us have an awareness of that. Either we've heard about it or maybe even seen that. Um, so this emphasis on rules as food, as being good food or bad food, um, it can be internalized by family members as the only option. And while again, because in our families, we have a loved one with PWS, which makes that very necessary, it also can be a potential risk factor for eating disorders and malnutrition. Now, I can't say that for sure because there's not been research, but from what I've heard, it sounds like that might be a possibility. Okay, so let's talk disordered eating versus eating disorder. There are some similarities, but there are also some important differences. 
So just some anecdotal reports um, that I have heard about um, in caregivers, I've heard of some binging um, in bedrooms, in closets, in cars. I've also heard um, of restricting calories and carbs um, in healthy siblings. So, you know, going to feed your children and making a certain type of meal for a PWS child and then giving healthy siblings a, a similar meal when they may have different and likely have different nutritional needs than the loved one with PWS. Um, among siblings, I've also heard reports of hoarding and hiding food in their rooms, which is problematic and uh, for a lot of reasons, but also importantly, it then can become a source of food seeking for a PWS sibling. So, you know, we've got the, the kitchen locked up, the refrigerator locked up, the pantry locked up, food all put away off the counter, but then the loved one with PWS is going to brother or sister's room and finding a stash of candy. Um, and siblings have also heard some calorie restriction and some weight loss, um, maybe sort of beyond what we would expect to see normally. Um, and, and there's a potential development for avoided or feared foods, which could have some long-term consequences. You know, if, if a child grows up fearful of carbs and believing that if you have carbs, you're going to gain weight and this is the worst thing ever, um, then long-term, that might be something that they end up struggling with. We can't talk about food without talking about body. Uh, so body image is an important part of every human being's um, idea of who they are and how they move about in the world. And that body image is impacted by a lifetime of events. And some of those important events are your parents' body image and the messaging that your parents gave you about how they felt about their own body. Um, and, and that has a large impact. So if if you hear your, your father compliment um, your mom and say, you know, honey, you look great. She's like, oh, I look fat. Well, that's important messaging about how your mom feels about her body and, and how she feels, how, how she is able to take a compliment or not take a compliment can really be internalized and shape the way that you view your own body. Um, we also know that puberty and middle age can be particularly difficult um, in terms of body satisfaction and perhaps unsurprising to any of us, um, more than 90% of women report body dissatisfaction. This hits all ages, all sizes, and all races and ethnicities. Unfortunately, low body dissatisfaction is also a predictor and maintenance factor of, of disturbed eating. It could be eating disorder. It also could be disordered eating. Um, it's also a predictive factor for social anxiety. So avoiding going out in public because I don't like the way that I look, um, depressive symptoms, a low quality of life and low self-esteem. Body image is often tied to self-worth, to your ability to view yourself as someone worthy of love. Um, and what I, what is really important in a lot of areas of our life, but particularly as it comes to body image, is that the voice inside your head is the loudest. So you could have your partner telling you you look great, you could have your siblings telling you you look great, your friends tell you you look great, your therapist tells you you look great, but really at the end of the day, what you're saying to yourself is going to drown out all of those other voices. And that negative thinking can become a habit. So let's talk about disordered eating behaviors. So examples might include fad diets and cleanses, skipping meals, um, high anxiety around specific foods, most often fat and carbs, um, supplement misuse or diet pills, um, chronic rate, weight fluctuations, eating as a coping mechanism. So I feel stressed, I feel sad, I feel angry, or I'm bored, so I'm gonna eat. Um, feeling a, a loss of control around food or really compulsively eating, using exercise or food restriction or even laxatives to make up for bad foods consumed, and also eating in secret. Eating disorders um, are a, a, a more severe form of many of those things. So just because you have, so some of those things could be disordered eating, eating some of those things could in combination with other factors rise, rise to the level of an eating disorder. Um, 20 million women um, can struggle with an eating disorder in their lifetime. And, and for a while, it was really only conceptualized as a woman's issue. Um, but more and more recently, we are becoming much more adept at identifying men who are struggling with an eating disorder, young men who are at risk for eating disorder and getting them the appropriate treatment. 
of note um, because you know if you're on this talk, my guess is that you um, are a parent or a caregiver, and it's important to understand that children with parents, especially moms who are very weight centric and are frequently dieting are more likely to develop an eating disorder as an adolescent. Some common warning signs of an eating disorder include um, obsessive thoughts about controlling your food, weight loss, dieting, maybe there are some food rituals that develop. Um, so, you know, cutting the crust off of bread, cutting food into tiny little bites, eating food in a specific order. There might be some social withdrawal, um, frequent dieting, body checking, extreme mood swings. Um, on the physical side, you're going to see noticeable weight fluctuations. There might be some GI complaints. Um, there can be diz dizziness upon standing because their heart rate has dropped really low or has become irregular. Um, hard time concentrating because, you know, they're sort of brain starved. Um, you also see a lot of hormonal changes um, in estrogen levels, testosterone, and thyroid. And there can also be issues with, um, with your teeth, with your skin, with your hair, and your nail health. So the DSM-5 lays out um, four of the major eating disorders, and then there's sort of this like other catch-all category. So anorexia is a restriction of calories that results in extreme weight loss. Bulimia is a binge followed by a purge. Binge eating disorder is periods of uncontrolled eating past the point of feeling full. And then avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which we call ARFID, um, is really extreme picky eating. Um, and then there's the catch-all. So how can we improve our relationship with food, right? Now what? Thanks for all this depressing information. Now what do we do? Well, I am a cognitive behavior trained therapist. So first and foremost, I wanna look at how do we think about food? How do we think about our body and how do we think about how those things intersect? Um, and then I wanna talk about ways we can address our physical vulnerabilities because that can set us up to making better choices that are in the service of our goals. And then talk about ways that maybe we can develop some new skills and traditions and then some other professional resources to get you going. So first and foremost, um, let's explore your value system. What does food mean to you? Um, these questions that I'm gonna ask you, maybe this is worth doing some journaling over. Maybe these are things you've given a lot of thought to before. Maybe it's something you've given absolutely no thought to before. Um, so I would recommend doing some journaling about it or if you're currently in therapy, um, ch chatting with your therapist about some of these things or maybe even finding a therapist to talk to about some of these things. So food, what does food mean to you? Is it just uh, gas in the tank? Is it energy? Is it something that's gotta be earned or avoided? Is it a source of, of negative emotions like guilt or shame? Or is it a friend that's always there, right? Like people come and go, but food's always there to help me feel better. Um, is it an escape? Is it something to do to pass the time because I'm bored and what else am I gonna do? Um, or is it some or all, some of these things or none of these things? you know, what's the meaning that you, what does it have in your life now? And what's the meaning that you want it to have in your life? And importantly, what's the meaning that you hope it'll have in your kids' lives? Now, what does your body mean to you? Is it something that, is it a vehicle to help you meet, reach your goals? Is it, does it dictate your value as a human being? or as a parent? Um, is it something that provides for your family in either the work that you do or the food that it creates? Is it a source of guilt or shame or anxiety? Is it something that makes you vulnerable or unsafe? I know for me as a woman, there's been many times in my life that, that having an awareness of my body and what it looks like and what its limitations are has made me feel vulnerable walking alone in a parking lot at night. Um, is your body something that has betrayed you or your child? Uh, I know that for me with Victoria, my, my water broke at 31 weeks um, and PWS diagnosis aside, I mean, even before then, I, I felt so betrayed by my body. How could my body have done this to me? Is it some of these things? Is it none of these things? Is it something else that I haven't thought of? Um, you know, do some thinking on this on your own. Again, what's the meaning that you want it to have in your life? What in a, in a perfect world, if we could wave a magic wand, what would your body mean to you ideally? And then what is the meaning that you hope it will have for your kids too? Okay, so what is your food goal? Is it health 
or is it weight loss? And sometimes those things can go hand in hand, but I think that it's important to, to really examine and explore what is the, the lens that we are viewing food through, um, because that is going to, to help us to make choices and decisions in the service of that, right? So if we can look at what does food mean to me now? What do I want it to mean? What does my body mean to me now? What do I want it to be? And ultimately, what's my goal? Is it to be healthy or is it to lose weight? Or is it some combination of the two? And once we've constructed this value system, then we can make choices in the service of that value system. So health versus weight loss, I think one way I sort of think about it is it, do you view food as fuel or do you view, view blah, 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 rewind. Is it food as fuel or do you view it as food as something that's earned or deserved? Um, are you focusing on the number on the scale or how you feel physically and emotionally? I would vote that we should be focusing on how we feel physically and emotionally and actually really advocate that people don't weigh themselves more than once a week. Um, of note, if you need to lose weight to improve your health, it's really, really important to separate the goals of weight loss and body acceptance because developing a po positive relationship with your imperfect body is gonna improve, improve your ability to lose excess weight. This might look like shifting the narrative from, I can eat this donut or this cake or whatever, or I can feel more energetic, more clear headed or more in control of my emotions. We also need to explore our cultural and family influences when we are, excuse me, developing our value system. Food is an integral part of re reward, celebration, showing love, grieving, repairing a relationship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we live in a culture that really emphasizes food as being, being an activity in and of itself right? Like, what are we going to do? Well, we'll have a large spread of food and it'll be sitting out all day and, and we'll just graze. And, and that's sort of the, the activity. So, you know, those cultural and family influences are going to, to really um, shift and shape how we develop a meal blueprint or a schema, right? Like what's the order of things when I think about sitting down to have a meal? Do all meals end with dessert? How frequent are special treats? Um, what about serving sizes or the clean plate club? I mean, in my early um, family influences, you didn't leave food on your plate. You had a large plate full of food and the expectation was that you cleared it. And if you left food on your plate, on your plate, you were questioned as to why you might run the risk of hurting grandma's feelings because she worked so hard to prepare this for us. Um, and that really influenced my relationship with food. Are family meals at the dinner table or are meals on the go? There's not a right or a wrong answer to any of these questions that I'm asking you today. They are just things that I want you to be thinking about in a very intentional way. Okay, so now let's talk about why are we eating or how are you feeling when you make the decision to eat? Are you feeling hungry? Are you having hunger cues? Or are you feeling emotional or overwhelmed or bored? Are you, right? Are you physically hungry or emotionally hurting? We know that deprivation, meaning I'm restricting carbs or I'm restricting my calories for the day, um, or, you know, I'm skipping lunch every day, whatever it might be. Deprivation plus stress, which I mean, all of us in this community have way more than our fair share of it, let's be clear. Um, but deprivation plus stress is really setting us up for a lot of emotional eating. Um, and so we need to be very clear in our mind, what's a craving versus what's hunger. And so if you're having urges for specific, often unhealthy foods, that's likely emotional. I've yet in both my personal or my professional life, I've yet to encounter someone that was feeling um, really emotionally overwhelmed and using food as, as a way of getting through that experience and said, like, I feel really sad. I just want baby carrots. Like I just, <laughs> I don't, I, I've never heard that. Um, and then thinking about what, when you eat something, when you consume something, how do you feel? Do you feel better? Do you feel worse? How long does that feeling last? So I have had my own experiences in my life with emotional eating and, and, you know, when I really stop to reflect back and, and take a look, I would feel better for all of about 
90 seconds. And then I started not feeling better. I, the feeling of like overfulness would set in, or maybe it was like too much sugar. It's a big, big sugaraholic. Um, and, and so like that feeling of like, oh, this is a really good donut or whatever was so fleeting, but the feeling of like, oh, my body doesn't love the fact that I just ate all that sugar, um, lasted a lot longer. And I want to be very clear. I don't want to be a party pooper, but food is not an effective or healthy coping mechanism. It just isn't. I, I get, and I fully appreciate that for so many of us, it always has been there as a coping mechanism, but it's not. And we need to, to really take a look in the mirror and get real about that. Okay. So when you are emotionally eating, what's the emotion that you're feeding? right? What's the emotion you want to be feeding? Am I, am I feeling love and peace and calm when I eat something that reminds me of my grandmother and our afternoons together, you know, after school? Well, that's a fond memory, right? And, and we always had pistachio ice cream. And so every time I have pistachio ice cream, it makes me feel loved and at peace. Well, okay, so what's something else that might give that same feeling of feeling loved and at peace? Maybe it's looking at photographs or, or you know, revisiting places that we went to together. But if I'm feeling afraid and, and bored or sad, I don't wanna keep feeling that and eating something isn't going to change that feeling, but what's something that might? So if I'm feeling bored and my go-to is when I'm bored, I'm going to eat some chips and salsa. Um, what's something that might make me feel the opposite of bored? Well, let's do something. Let's go for a walk. Let's play a game with the kids. Let's, you know, reorganize the closet. <laughs> Maybe that doesn't sound fun, but it's, it's not going to, you're not bored at that point. Right. Um, I do think that it's also really important as we are exploring these things and, and as we are challenging ourselves and challenging the thoughts that we may or may not be having around food and our body and, and those relationships is that I firmly believe, um, and, and I want you to as well, that we are all doing the very best that we can in any given moment with the resources available to us at that time. Unfortunately, using food to manage distress only perpetuates that distress we're not solving the problem. We're really not even putting a band-aid on it. So I would really love if, if, if people, not just our community, but people in general, got to a place where we could take food off the resource list when we're having a hard time. And one thing I think that is useful in accomplishing that task is limiting the amount of, of high sugar, high fat, high carb, we all know the foods, right? That you keep on hand. The things that, again, because when we are emotionally overloaded, no one ever tells me they're craving a salad, right? So there, so if we make it harder to find the things that we are, are reaching for when we feel our worst, if, if all I have to do is open the pantry door and there it is, well, when I'm feeling my worst, it's gonna be really hard for me to make a different decision. But if I'm feeling my worst and I open my pantry and I don't have the option of a box of Ho-Hos, well, then I have a minute to stop and think, well, how badly do I want this box of ho-hos? Because now it means not just walking to the kitchen. Now it means putting on pants, putting on shoes, grabbing my purse, getting in the car, driving to the store, putting on my mask, going into the store, right? Like now it's a process. And those are all various opportunities where I might make a different choice because again, food is not a healthy or effective coping mechanism. Okay, so we've talked about um, some of those influences and, and ways to think about those things. Now let's talk about some physical vulnerabilities that set us up to, to not make choices that are always in the service of our value system. Physical illness is a big one. Um, I know a lot of moms in general and definitely moms in the special needs community that, um, and, I, and I don't wanna say just moms, dads too, if you're listening, parents in general, parents in the special needs community um, that are, very on top of their kids stuff, right? Like, I, I mean, I can't imagine my daughter missing a medical appointment, but like if something comes up, I don't always think twice about rearranging my own medical stuff, right? We, 
we give and give and give and give, and that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. But also we need to remember that, remember to take our prescribed medications every day as they are prescribed, not overdoing it, not skipping a day, oh well, but really being intentional and mindful about of following the, the medical advice that we've been given. And then also visiting a doctor to discuss symptoms that you've been experiencing, following up on tests and procedures. You know, if something new is cropping up, not just saying, oh, it'll get better, it'll get better, it'll get better. Not suggesting that you run to the doctor every time you have a, a, a new something going on that feels different. But I am suggesting that, that far too often parents kick our own can of health and well being down the road and we're not doing ourselves or our children any favors by doing so. Another important component um, to physical wellness is also staying hydrated. Um, you know, just being really intentional of getting enough fluids um, and you know, speak with your physician. My physician has told me that half of my body weight in ounces is the amount that I should be aiming for every day in water. Oh gosh. Uh-oh. Sorry guys. I don't know what button I hit. <laughs> okay. Um, avoiding substances or at a minimum use them in, in moderation. And this includes alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, medications prescribed to other people, illegal drugs, et cetera. Um, and this is especially problematic when substance use is replacing coping skills, right? So, um, and don't get me wrong, I love a glass of wine, but I, I, I do worry at times that many people can use something like a glass of wine to replace maybe some meditation skills or other relaxation skills to wind down at the end of the day. And that if that is happening, one glass of wine can become three glasses of wine, can become a bottle of wine and, and it becomes a, a bit of a slippery slope. So I really encourage people to always be very mindful of how and why are you drinking much like how or why are you eating? Um, balance sleep, super important. Many people, certainly in our community, I'm definitely one of them, um, do not get enough sleep. Um, and some, especially those with depression, might get too much sleep. So we, again, it's, it's balance. Everything that I'm talking about is, is balance. Um, so not co it's, sleep is not a coping skill if it's used as a way of avoidance. Sleep is super important, but it can't be, I don't wanna face this day, so I'm gonna stay in bed all day and pull the, the covers over my head. Um, sleep deprivation is also associated with an increase in calorie consumption. So some studies have put it almost 400 additional calories a day, um, are consumed when people are sleep deprived because our body, when it doesn't get enough sleep is looking for a quick source of energy. Um, and, and it's often finding that source of energy in food and sleep deprived people tend to not make the best food choices because they're looking for a quick, fast source of energy of energy. Um, sleep deprivation is also associated with increases in ghrelin and it lowers leptin. So it makes us more hungry um, and, and, and contributes to that calorie consumption. Um, balanced eating. So that's not binging, that's not restricting, it's just balanced eating. You know, looking at, and, you know, really we all have these skills because we're doing it for our kids. And so really generalizing some of those skills and recognizing the, the balance that they have and they're eating and trying to apply that to our own lives. Um, any number of things can make it super difficult to eat healthy meals on a consistent and regular basis. And, and I think that what I had to, when Victoria was born and, and we started really examining the way that we were eating, um, I had to really have some serious soul searching kind of conversations with myself because there were foods that I wouldn't dare give Victoria. I wouldn't even consider like, oh, don't even suggest it to me. I would never let her eat that. But I was putting it in my body on a regular basis. And like, that doesn't, that didn't make a lot of sense. Like I would sit down at the table and look at, at her food and, and I feed her brother, little brother in much the same way. And I would look at my kid's food and I would look at my plate and be like, this is not, hmm, hmm. So just something to think about. Um, also restriction and binging often go hand in hand. And so when you are trying to, to limit carbs all day um, and maybe it's in solidarity with your PWS loved one, but by doing so you're running the risk of then binging carbs at night because our, all of our bodies are different. 
Um, and for those of us without PWS, our nutritional needs are likely going to be different than our loved one with PWS. And so when we are limiting foods the way that our, we limit it for our loved one, we are setting ourselves up for not having our own nutritional needs met. And that might result in some binging at a later time. Um, we also want to move our body when we want to get some exercise. Um, the mental and physical health benefits of exercise are well established, have been for a really long time. Um, and so it's important to, to move your body. Okay, so let's talk about some things that we can do now um, to, to get you guys started. So first, I really encourage everyone to figure out your goals and your value system around food. Um, and certainly, as I mentioned before, a professional can help with this. And then I would make food purchases in the service of that value system. I think it benefits everyone also to start eating mindfully and intentionally. Um, I don't know about you, but I know that many people joke about how quickly their PWS loved one eats. My daughter certainly eats very quickly. But if, if PWS wasn't part of the picture, I would joke that she got that from me. I have my family, my entire life has made fun of me for how quickly I eat. And so, you know, really stepping back and recognizing that I'm not even stopping to taste my food. I'm just sort of inhaling it. Um, stepping back and recognizing that I can slow down and like really pay attention to the texture of the food that I'm eating, like taste all of the different things that are, are all the ingredients. Um, you know, I try to identify ingredients in food now. Um, and that's a way of eating mindfully and more intentionally, you know, intentionally eating is eating when you're hungry, not necessarily like, well, because I just woke up an hour ago and I'm supposed to have breakfast, so I'm going to eat right now. Well, maybe you wait until you're hungry for, for breakfast. Um, also carving out times and places away from home and away from your PWS loved one to enjoy a specific treat might be a good idea um, instead of hiding things in a closet or in a car. Um, so, you know, getting ice cream with friends on, um, on your birthday versus keeping Ben and, ben and Jerry's in the freezer is also something to be mindful of that sort of speaks to this idea of balance um, and, and being intentional about how often special treats occur and what constitutes a special treat. Um, maintaining balance a scoop versus a pint. Um, and I say that as someone who used to exclusively eat the pint. Um, also no secret eating that cultivates shame. Um, eating in your car, eating in a closet, um, I mean, unless you're like eating in your car, because that's literally the only time that you're going to get to eat lunch that day. Like I get it. We've all been there. Um, but if you're, you know, secretly hiding, um, it's it, even if you're secretly hiding and eating baby carrots, like it's still, is there's something shameful about that? And it's going to cultivate that shame of like, why am I doing this? Am I supposed to be doing this? Is this okay? Et cetera. Um, and, and one way to kind of think about this idea is if you were going to have a midday drink, you know, if you had a mimosa with friends socially at a restaurant, no one would think that that was weird or odd or, or, and, and I imagine you wouldn't either, right? Um, unless alcohol is something that doesn't agree with you, but, you know, having a midday drink with a friend, a mimosa at a restaurant is one thing, but, you know, taking shots while you're hiding in the closet in the middle of the day, that's a very different, that very different situation. Um, in terms of our food rules, um, you know, I noted before that that adherence to the rules is important and, and in many cases can have life-threatening consequences. And also, I wanted to encourage us to try to be as flexible as we can be because the total rigidity around it, um, you know, I worry that we'll drive ourselves crazy, but also total rigidity is going to increase anxiety. It's going to increase social isolation, both for your family and your PWS loved one. And it has a high likelihood of increasing conflict around family members, right? Because again, everyone has new, different nutritional needs. Everyone likely has different schedules. Um, and so having some flexibility where appropriate, I think is really important for the, the balance in the family. Also, when we are totally, totally, totally rigid, it doesn't give our PWS loved one a real world experience. And I think that that's an, an important thing for them to see, you know, maybe my siblings are eating different size, like serving sizes than I'm eating, or maybe they're even eating different foods than I'm eating and all of that's okay. And, and we are running from therapy to doctor appointment to therapy, you know, et cetera. And, oh shoot, they ran long and now we're not going to make it home for dinner exactly at five o'clock. Like we always have it. So maybe it's going to be five. 45 before we have dinner and, and, and helping our kids 
us being okay with it and, and modeling for our kids that it's okay. Um, one thing that you could try if, if you're not able to answer a lot of these questions um, in a very clear way is to do a food log um, to figure out what you might be eating or craving when you're feeling certain emotions. And then as we talked about before, identifying something else, maybe non-food related that might give you the same feelings or that opposite feeling. Um, trying eating carbs early in the day so you aren't craving them at night and that you're more likely to make wise choices around type and portion size when you're spreading it out through the day as opposed to just sort of restricting yourself all day and then trying to make choices at night when you're hungry and maybe sort of nutritionally craving something in particular. Um, making sure you drink enough water throughout the day. Um, I also really recommend for everyone, um, every patient I see, every person in my life, um, try meditation, even for five minutes. I, I don't say this because like, oh, here we go. I have something else to add to my plate. I understand like our plates are, are full and overflowing. Um, but meditation and mindfulness are things that, that have never been easier to work into your life. Um, so there's a bunch of really wonderful apps that are out there. Um, I personally have tried Headspace and Balance. I like them both. Um, there's even, if you have Netflix, um, Headspace has a series on Netflix. That's really excellent. I think it's eight episodes. Um, so look for that. Um, you can also mindfully wash dishes or brush your teeth or drive. And what this looks like essentially is, is say, you, say you want to mindfully drive, turn off the radio, silence your phone, and just focus on the act of driving. So what does your hand feel like on the steering wheel? What does your butt feel like sitting in the chair? What are you seeing on the road? What color car is there? Who, what's on the side of the road? What do you see in the sky? What do the signs say? Um, and what are you hearing? And, and what are you smelling? Maybe you just drove by a, you know, a, a construction site and you smell you know, the smells that come from a construction site. I don't know what they would be called, but, um, but really focusing on the five senses as you do this one task. And it's a, it's a really nice way of incorporating mindfulness into daily activities without having to do something extra, right? You can do the same thing with brushing your teeth, the same thing with washing dishes. You're gonna do it anyway, but you might as well do it mindfully. Um, I also really like starting each day with writing down three things that you're grateful for. So there's plenty that's going wrong, um, but it can really be a, a nice shift to focus on some things that are going right. Um, Self-affirmations are, are wonderful. There's lots of good apps for that. There's cards that you can buy on Amazon, like little card decks where you just pick one each day and it gives you a new affirmation. Um, or you could do what, what I call post-it note therapy. Um, so for many of my patients, I'll, I'll write down an affirmation on a post-it note. I'll hand it to them, take this home, put it on your mirror in your bathroom, put it on the dashboard of your car, put it on the edge of your computer, just put it somewhere where you're going to see it. And every time you see it, I want you to say it either out loud or in your head, repeat that thing to yourself three times. Um, you could also create a list and or a box of self-soothing items. So things that, um, that help that you enjoy. So again, thinking about the five senses is a good one. Um, thinking about things that distract you um, and that might help you get through, through a tough time or a difficult emotion. I also think, um, you know, again, because we can't separate food from body image entirely. Um, and I think limiting social media is a really important thing. Um, both not only the time spent on it, but also the content that you're consuming um, because that stuff gets in and it influences us more than we know. We're, research is every year more and more is coming out um, with not often very positive things to say about the effects of social media on our mental health. Um, so I think it's really important to limit that. Um, get moving. The best, best exercise is the one that you'll do. Um, so maybe that's walking your kids to school. Maybe it's taking a Zumba class. Maybe it's streaming a yoga lesson or lifting weights, or maybe you're someone who's training for a marathon, go you. Um, or maybe it's just chasing after your kids outside because that's all the time you've got or all the energy you've got um, or both. Do your own landscaping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But just get moving. Prioritize sleep. This is a hard one, but it's worth it, I promise. We really have to practice good sleep hygiene. So here are some examples. Establish a bedtime routine, just like you would with your kids. 
Like most parenting resources identify having sleep problems with your toddler, having sleep problems with your kid, establish a bedtime routine. Adults need one too. It helps us, it helps cue our body and our mind to start winding down and getting ready. Go to bed and wake up the same time every day. Yes, even on the weekends. I know you want to sleep in, I want to sleep in too. And if you have kids that are old enough that allow you to sleep in, it's even more tempting, but it's not good sleep hygiene. Avoid screens 30 to 60 minutes before bed. Um, for some people that needs to be even longer. Uh, I've worked with some people who can have like their phone in their face, you know, moments before they go to sleep. And then I've worked with other people that if they're looking at a screen for two hours before bed, like they're having a really hard time going to sleep. Um, optimize your bedroom for sleeping. So make sure there's no lights and think about like lights on the clock, the lights that come through the cracks on the blind, the lights from the, the smoke detector. I mean, think about all those little lights we don't necessarily pay attention to, but um, try to cover up light, reduce light, decrease the temperature, set that temperature. You know, I understand that energy costs are what they are, um, but do what you can to make your room cool. Uh, limit noise and sometimes getting a white noise machine um, can be really beneficial for sort of blocking out um, other more distracting noises that might be disrupting your sleep cycle. Comfortable sheets, etc. good pillow, good mattress. Um, no large meals two hours before bed. Don't nap. No napping. Napping is really bad for our sleep hygiene. If you're going to exercise or when you exercise, um, try to do so earlier in the day. I know that for a lot of people, the only time that they get is maybe you know, in the evening after the kids are asleep or after work. Um, and again, this affects some people way more than it affects others. Um, but if, if you're finding that your sleep is disrupted and you are exercising right before bed, then try to bump that up earlier and see if it improves your sleep. Use your bed only for sleeping and sex. Don't eat in bed. Don't watch TV in bed. Um, sleep hygiene dictates that beds are for sleep and sex. Um, and if you can't sleep, sit in a chair quietly in the dark with no screens until you feel sleepy. This doesn't work for everyone. Um, personally, I've, it's never worked for me. Um, so if you do wake up and leaving your bed and sitting someplace quietly in the dark doesn't work for you, then I recommend resting as much as you can. Just lay totally still, eyes closed, and really get good rest. Because if you can't sleep, sleep is best, but rest is important. Okay, so we want to be extra mindful of our, um, our healthy siblings. And these are some specific things that I, I would pay attention with the kiddos because I think it's really easy for caregivers to like, yeah, 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 I'll get to me and, and feeling better and, and being healthier when I get to it. But my kids, what do I gotta do with my kids? So. I think it's really important to be mindful that children are hearing you talk. And so we need to pay attention to the way that we're talking about bodies, our body, and even our, our PWS kiddos body, um, their weight, BMI, healthy siblings are likely overhearing that talk. And if they are, they might not really know what to do with it, or they might be internalizing it in a way that is not helpful for them in the long run. So I would really be intentional and mindful about how much of that they're exposed to and a part of. <clears throat> I also think that it's really important not to refuse to take a picture or to delete pictures because you don't like the way that they look because it sends a message that reinforces that appearance is everything and, and that it has to be just so. And it really feeds into this toxic social media culture that I think is very damaging for our, for our teens along those lines, limit their exposure to social media in general, monitor who they follow, monitor the content they're viewing, how much time they're spending. And I really, really, really discourage the use of filters, especially for teens and adolescents. I think that it just sets such unrealistic expectations. They're fun and they're cute, but I think we need to think about the message that they're sending. Um, and I do worry that in a world where social media has so much power and so many people are using filters and Photoshopping to adjust the way they look, I, it just scares me for our young people. Um, so, so try to limit that as, as much as you can. 
um, if you you have a healthy sibling that is restricting their food intake, it's important to educate them that their brain and body does not have the same difficulty as their sibling with PWS. And so, you know, X, Y, Z food or quantity of food might not be okay for their PWS sibling, but it's not bad for their body and really helping them get some education around that. Um, and, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but be, you know, have your siblings be mindful of limiting carbs and solidarity with a loved one, um, because we all have different carbohydrate needs and theirs are likely to be greater than their PWS sibling. I also think it can be super helpful to establish new traditions in your family that are not centered around food. Um, so, and I think this is great just in general, like PWS or no PWS. So finding activities and shared interests that cultivate connections like game nights or taking hikes or gardening, um, things of that sort. Or, you know, even if like you love cooking, so maybe instead of um, focusing on baking cookies or um, really elaborate cakes, which is so cool, but but maybe instead of exclusively doing that as an activity with your children, maybe it's like, let's learn how to make Thai food, something like that. Okay, so here are also some some ref, some resources um, that you could pursue. So, you know, again, speaking with a licensed therapist can help you work through any and all of these issues that we've talked about today, preferably someone with experience in both obesity and eating disorders. I say this because um, in the, among those in, with an eating disorder exclusive background, you're more likely to encounter an approach of like, there's no such thing as a bad food. Um, and it, it was actually sort of side note, very interesting to me to um, have eating disorder training and then to have a child with PWS because everything that Dr. Miller was saying to me and her, her dietitians were saying to me and everything that I was learning was just flying in the face of what I had been taught about eating disorders and like people's relationship with food. And so, I suspect that if we, if, if anyone in our community saw someone who only has experience in eating disorders, there might be a bit of like cognitive dissonance going on where you might be in a position where a therapist is telling you something that you're like, no, but actually there are bad foods, like ask Dr. Miller. <laughs> um, so I do think that ideally, if you can find someone with both um, obesity and eating disorder experience, that they might have sort of both views. Um, uh, uh, those that work in like obesity and weight management, they have more training on like balance and health focus um, and things of that sort. So just sort of a side note. I'm also very happy to consult. Um, so I'll give you some contact information, but but feel free to reach out to me or to, to have uh, your therapist contact me directly. This book, Body Image Workbook, it's great. Um, this next slide, I'm going to give you a couple of other books that you could check out, but I, this one um, by Thomas Cash is really good, the Body Image Workbook. It is a workbook that you can work through. It's going to have a lot of writing prompts and questions and quizzes, and um, I think it's a great book. I think it's like 16 bucks on Amazon. Um, physically, if you're feeling out of sync, out of whack physically, there's weird symptoms or things going on that maybe you've been neglecting for a while, go see your PCP, or if they're kind of vague or you feel like you're not getting answers, um, and I say this from personal experience, seek out a functional medicine physician. Um, I had some really weird symptoms about a year and a half ago. My PCP said I was fine. My labs were fine. I'm like, yeah, but I don't feel fine. Like, I'm not fine. Um, I saw functional medicine. They ran totally different labs, asked me totally different questions um, and discovered that I have an autoimmune disease. So uh, I really can't say enough about functional medicine. I, I do feel like it, um, I feel like it's changed my life. Um, if you're looking for meal plan, meal planning guidance, advice, nutritionist or dietitian. And if you need motivation, accountability groups can be a great way of, of getting that and maintaining that. Okay, so here are some additional books that you can try. I'll leave that up for a second. And if you are worried that you or a loved one might have an eating disorder, there are treatments. So there's various psychotherapies, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and interpersonal therapy. Those are the main ones that you'll see. Um, and if, if someone is, 
I mean, that's what I would look for. Like if I had a loved one with an eating disorder and a therapist was not doing one of those, I would find a new therapist. Um, it, for children and adolescent, adolescents, the absolute gold standard um, is um, Maudsley. So you really want to look for that. Um, and there's different levels of care. So there's outpatient where you see someone like once a week or every other week, or maybe even twice a week. Um, and then there's intensive outpatient programs, which um, are like half of the day, but four or five days a week. And then there's partial hospitalization programs, which are every day, all day. And then there's residential where they stay the night, they don't go home. And then of course, inpatient, which is at the hospital in a unit. Some additional eating disorder resources. The National Eating Disorder Association um, is a great place to start, tons of resources. Um, they have a, a text line, they have a chat, they have a, a, a phone line, it's full of lots of resources. That's where I would start. All right, um, if you would like to connect or if you or your therapist wants to talk to me, you can be reached at that email address, um, feel free. Any questions? That was amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I do not see any questions in the chat, but I do encourage participants to jump in and write um, any questions you have in the Q&A. We'll wait a few minutes. Um, Sarah's asking, did you say that naps are not recommended? No, they're not. not they're not a part of sleep hygiene. Um, you know, there's often this idea that we're going to catch up on some sleep that's been missed, but you don't really catch up on sleep. So the kind of like with our kids, when you think about like sleep debt, I don't know if, if anyone else has had this experience or it's just me of like, it's an hour before nap time and you're terrified that your child's going to fall asleep in their car seat on the way home because then they might not nap. Um, it, adults are not all that different. And so if we as adults take a nap midday, um, and now I will say like there's an exception for older adults, but for, for most of us, um, taking a nap midday is, is just going to decrease that sleep debt and make it harder to fall asleep and stay asleep throughout the night that night. And then you find yourself in this sort of perpetuating cycle. Okay. The next question, how do you have the conversation with your PWS loved one that their food needs to be different than other people's food? Great question. It is a great question. Um, well, I think first and foremost, their age matters and their, their cognitive abilities matter um, because you wanna make sure that it's developmentally appropriate. Um, so I, I guess that would really influence how I would answer this question. Um, so like right now with my four-year-old, you know, if she sees that, that Bubby has bread, which she loves bread, um, Bubby has bread and she doesn't have bread, um, we talk about now because she's four that she has a special tummy and, and Bubby's tummy does okay with that much bread, but her tummy doesn't. And so she can't have that. Um, and she doesn't always like it. And we have to have that conversation pretty often, <clears throat> but I mean, that's as far as we're going sort of developmentally at this point, um, with an older kid, I, I think I would still take a similar sort of matter of fact approach of, that we are all different as people and, and you have prader willi syndrome and you can eat these foods and you can't eat other foods. And maybe dad has diabetes and he can eat these foods, but he can't eat those other foods. And, you know, maybe sibling has the gluten intolerance, right. And just sort of pointing out that, you know, people have different tummies and, and some people's bodies react differently to, to different foods, but I would approach it very matter of fact, like this just is, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just is, and, and this is how we're going to move forward. You can still though validate and, and show some compassion of like, I, I understand that it's hard. You really want to have blah, 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 but your body's not going to respond to that very well. It's going to make you sick. And so we're not going to let you have that. Great. Any other questions?
All right, well, thank you again. Uh, we will be sending out a recording of this presentation um, to everyone who had registered and encourage you to share it with people. The information was fantastic. Um, so thank you for all of you who attended and especially you, Dr. Cooper, for being with us. Thanks so much.